certified interior designer, and you probably didn't know that that was necessary in the state of Florida. Um, I am also a certified veterinary technician. Um, interestingly enough, and I wasn't going to share this, but interestingly enough, in the state of Florida, you do not have to be certified to be a veterinary technician, but you do have to be certified to be an interior designer. So I cannot help you pick out your drapes, but I can euthanize your dog. <laughs> uh, so there's something very odd in that, but we're in a government building, so we won't say anymore. Uh, as a designer, I was privileged to create people's living spaces. As a pet hospice nurse, I am honored to create not dying spaces, but hopefully spaces of living until life ends and a place for remembrance after death. I like to think that I facilitate uh, the closing of the circle in its most perfect form. Um, this particular symbol I love, it's, it's the perfect human-animal bond symbol. And I have this that I wanted to share with you all because it, for me, it, it is the epitome of what the human-animal bond is. Um, this woman and her dog looking, staring adoringly into each other's eyes and saying, if I could give you one thing in life, I would give you the ability to see yourself through my eyes. Only then would you realize how special you are to me. And my question to ask is, who do you think is speaking those words in this picture? I know what I think, but I think that's what's so wonderful about it. Who's saying those words to whom? Um, loving and caring completely through to the end of life, to death and beyond, the Great Muzzle Organization says puppyhood lasts a lifetime. Our responsibility to our pets is not temporary or limited in any way. In fact, it's a commitment. I was at a wedding this weekend where they used the word obligation. It's an obligation we must honor, just like any vow. Till death do us part. <laughs> now, what I love about this picture, she looks like she's wearing a little onesie uh, for her bridal dress. But for anybody who doesn't like dogs dressed up, this was just for fun. Um, here's, the, here's the thing. If these dogs were married their entire brief lives, they would still be married seven times longer than most people. <laughs> Just as a sidebar. Why would we even consider that our aged pets are no longer our responsibility and that they've somehow lost their value? In all of my experiences and in my most current personal life experience with Allison, who is a 14-year-old Florida cur, um, a senior pet is at its absolute peak value. Uh, she gets me now. We connect more deeply and she doesn't eat my shoes anymore. <laughs> I learned the lessons on how to age gracefully from my aging dogs. Having a pet with whom you age is better than any medicine, and I want to repeat that. Having a pet with whom you age is absolutely better than any medicine. Um, I want to share with you Freckle's story. Uh, Freckle was an eight-year-old um, English Springer Spaniel that I adopted many years ago from the Humane Society. Um, she was grossly obese, uh, and I know this story by heart, but I'm sorry I get so drawn off on, in, in this tale that I want to be able to tell it to you appropriately. Um, she was grossly obese and had an inch-thick layer of stress drool on her double D chest. Um, it was not love at first sight. However, she became the love of my life and my best friend. In her 15th year, she started to show signs of arthritis and hind end weakness. Um, so I laid down lily pads. Everybody knows what lily pads are. They're rubber-backed bath mats. Mine happened to be green, so we called them lily pads. And they went all over the wood floor on the first floor of this home that also had a staircase that led up to the bedrooms. Um, not as dog-friendly a home as we would have liked, but she was able to move around that first floor. If she wanted to be in the kitchen, if she wanted to be in the television room, if she wanted to go to the patio, she was stable. There were enough of them, and she was stable enough on her own to get up and down. Um, I did get a bit anxious about the time that she could no longer use the stairs. I was anticipating. It was anticipatory anxiety. Um, and it wasn't a matter of the mechanics. I actually already had a baby gate that I knew would function well enough. 
the problem was, um, and there was another issue of, you know, there's whining at the bottom of the stairs, maybe sleepless nights. Those really weren't the issues. The issue for me was, how would I tell Freckle? How would I tell this dog that I love so much that she could no longer participate in the evening ritual of going to bed at night and waking up in the morning with her family? Uh, the day came, and when I discussed it with Bob, my partner, my life partner, he said, I'll just carry her up. I said, okay, my hero. Uh, this was no mean feat, considering Freckle had a huge lipoma and was 50 pounds of potato sack. <laughs> uh, on the fifth or sixth night, when he went to swoop her up, he leaned in, and she kind of backed away. And he leaned in again, and she backed away a second time. And now he's like, damn it, Freckle, I want to go to bed. Come on, let's go. So he, he went to lean in again, and she walked right around him and went to the dog bed, this beautiful dog bed that sat by the base of the stairs in the living room and had full view of the first floor. Um, my best friend in that moment took that monkey off my back. I didn't have to make the decision. I never had to put a baby gate up after that. She made the decision for me, for us, and said, I don't want him to hurt his back. I don't want you to be anxious about this anymore. I am perfectly happy here. Um, I can tell you that the next morning, I woke up and I thought, Freckle, where is Freckle? And I ran down the stairs, got to the landing, and I said, my love, I am so happy to see you this morning. And I proceeded to do the happy dance. Whatever everybody's happy dance is, I was happy dancing on the landing. We had big windows. As I'm happy dancing to my own beat and looking at her, she's gathering up her legs underneath of her, her little nubby's wagon, and she's starting to wiggle and do the happy dance herself. So we happy danced for a couple of minutes, and I went down and loved on her, and she dragged me off to the feeding station. Freckle um, went down one day. Front legs gave out after having to struggle with her hind end. Um, and it was an inflammation of an arthritis starting to settle into her elbows. I took her to my veterinarian, who I have known and, and loved and adored for many, many years. And um, she said, you know, you told me that when this happens, this is the time to say goodbye. I said, you know what, I know I said that and I'm gonna renege on it. Because I can tell you right now, it's not time. I know in my heart, in my soul, and, and I know for her, it is not time. I said, what are our alternatives? Lucky for me, uh, her husband, also a veterinarian, is an acupuncturist. And she called Dave in, Dr. Dave Ball, and Dave said, sure, we can try. Leave her with me for two hours, and you know, we'll see what we can do. For four and a half months, Freckle had acupuncture twice a week. We lived, we laughed, we cried, and we happy danced every morning for four and a half months. And I can tell you that that four and a half months gave me the opportunity to wrap my head around the fact that my buddy wasn't going to be with me much longer. It gave Freckle four and a half months of really great quality of life. Um, like I said, we happy danced every morning. What more could you ask for? Um, This is Freckle, and um, she was 16 when she died, naturally, uh, and very, very quickly. Uh, it was like watching a candle be snuffed out. We were out taking our little stroll around our cul-de-sac, and she fell over and died. Um, this is Freckle again. Uh, after a bath, having a bad hair moment, she obviously took a nap. Um, and this is Freckle again. Um, <laughs> Freckle didn't understand the concept of Christmas. Um, she, she thought the gift wrap was what the gift was all about. So after two hours of unwrapping presents, I would always wrap a little tiny thing in this huge amount of gift wrap. She would be surrounded by the wrapping paper. And Allison would have all the toys and treats off in her surroundings. But I will tell you that Freckle's life and her death continue to inspire me. Here's a quote by Emile Zola that I feel embodies my dedication. The fate of animals is of greater importance to me than the fear of appearing ridiculous. And for anybody who's a pet owner, I'm sure they agree with that, all of the ridiculous things we do. And I just proved it by doing the happy dance in front of all of you. Um, 
Aged or terminally ill pets teach us the value of living every day as if it is our last. Um, I would be remiss if I did not talk about my charity, the Gray Muzzle Organization. Um, so I'm going to do that kind of quickly so we can get on to other important matters. Gray Muzzle improved the lives of at-risk senior dogs who have been left homeless by financially supporting shelters and rescues and other nonprofits. Um, and helping them build programs for the special needs of old dogs. This is Willow, that beautiful sugar face. Uh, since 2008, Gray Muzzle has provided over $263,000 in grants to 38 nonprofits in 20 states. And here in Florida, our own Golden Retriever Rescue of Southwest Florida um, had, was given a grant for their miraculous work with senior and hospice dogs. Uh, Tampa Bay Dalmatian Rescue has also been a recipient. Um, I was hoping more rescue people would be here today. I don't mean you all from Domestic Animal Services, but I was hoping some more of the other rescue groups. I, I don't know that um, everyone is as well educated about what, what we do at Gray Muzzle, that we are in fact a grant organization. We're here to give you money if you will put the programs into place. Um, there are currently 70 volunteers around the country, and I'm always needing help here in Collier County, so if anyone particularly has a fondness for old dogs, please come and talk to me. Besides a bed fund that has donated over $10,000 in orthopedic beds to various organizations, including DAS, our own DAS, and most recently, closed in Animal Control, we support the following programs. And I won't read through these, but I will tell you that it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's a lot of good work that is being done, and education, awareness, and advocacy is what I practice and preach when I do public events locally. Um, we believe that old dogs contribute positively to our quality of life and have much to teach us about patience, respect, responsibility, and loyalty, attributes that are in short supply these days. Joy, love, and devotion are also in short supply in our world, and our dogs are an unrivaled reminder of these qualities, even in memory. I meant to apologize at the beginning to say anybody, and I may have said this and I don't recall, but um, I, I say dogs and I mean pets. Um, I happen to be at a, a, own dogs, and um, but I, I mean all of the same information for all of the cat people. Some of my best friends are cats. Um, as a culture, most Americans shy away from death because we can't control or conquer it. We try to ignore the poignancy of sweetly graying muzzles, slow gates, and weakened bladders. There will most certainly come a day when we will have to shepherd them from this world into the next. Just maybe one vision of dog heaven. Um, death is a natural part of the life cycle. The perfect circle. I mentioned earlier, something that if accepted can be a spiritual, peaceful, and gratifying time for the patient and the family members. When you bring a pet into your home, some powerful realities come along with him. Most likely, he will not outlive you, nor will he be able to tell you his wishes for the future or his precise nature of his suffering. Your pet may die naturally of old age, but it's more probable actually 90% more probable, that you'll have to decide when it's time. People often say to me, oh, I'll know when it's time. She'll tell me when it's time. He'll, it's not a big deal, he'll tell me when it's time. I believe that that telling requires an acute awareness, an awareness that can be absolutely lost by smothering anticipatory grief. I believe in advocacy, an advocacy that promotes responsibility for our pets when they need us the most. One of the most critical decisions an animal lover will ever have to make is the one that causes the most pain, grief, guilt, and regret, and it's when to let go. Advocating for your pet in death can help build a foundation of what can be called tolerable and appropriate grief, a grief that is natural and even healing. I want to share a story with you, another story about um, my friend Donna's kitty Schlitz. Um, I told this story once before, but it's, it's, a, it's another example of what hospice is and can be. And um, Donna, Donna, I didn't know Schlitz very well because Schlitz was kind of always under the bed when I was around Donna's house. And um, 
And she did call me one day and she said, with tears, would you help me to put, she likes to sleep. She's been, she'd been really sick. And I said, absolutely, I'll go with you. She said, no, I want you to, to go to do it yourself. Um, so I asked my other friend to go with me. And um, I didn't know Schlitz, and I didn't know, she, she said to me, now her bed is at the house, her, you know, the doctor is located here, and her favorite song is My Favorite Things. Now, I'm assuming that Donna said that to me because she wanted me to have some sense, she knew I loved music, and she wanted me to have some sense of who Schlitz was. Um, little did I know that when I went out to the garden, I picked Schlitz up out of the garden, I sat her down and I read to her one of my favorite books, The Next Place That You'll Go. I read that to her so she'd get accustomed to my voice and I then picked her up and put her in the car and we went to the doctors. And not thinking ahead, the clippers started up and I began to Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens. And I sang. And the wonderful part of how that equates to hospice is that, unbeknownst to both Donna and I, Donna, I gave Donna the gift of singing her pet to sleep. She gave me the gift of being, by telling me about that song, by being totally engaged in this spiritual transition of Schlitz, as opposed to being in the clinical place. I was, I leaned into Schlitz and I was just totally focused on where she was at in that moment. It was a powerful gift. Uh, veterinary hospice has been around for many years. It's only more recently, as the medicine has improved and our relationship with animals has changed, that we're seriously discussing and offering options to pet owners when it comes to their pet's end of life. We are only now defining um, animal hospice, which is also called pet hospice or veterinary hospice. We don't really like the term paw hospice. Um, you may come across that as well. Um, it's, it's a little too euphemistic. Um, and when I say we are now defining, there are lots of organizations and people out there on the West Coast in California, Oregon, Colorado, uh, Washington State, they are practicing. There are definitely doctors and nurses who are, pra and, and also social workers who are practicing uh, hospice care. Um, there are organizations, um, the International Association of Animal Hospice and Palliative Care, which they are hoping to change that name sometime down in the future here. Nikki's Hospice, Spirits in Transition, um, the PLPA, which is um, the branch that is involved in um, post-mortem care, and um, lots of other groups that, that, are, that are definitely the ones who are doing this. No one is an expert in this field. Um, it's, it is still in its elemental definitive stages. Euthanasia is an emotionally, although very much needed, so I will say that we, we, we were at the beginning, but we, we'd like to see this grow rapidly. Uh, euthanasia is an emotionally charged and controversial subject, and the main component that makes animal hospice different from human hospice. Otherwise, the similarities are there. There are various schools of thought within the, pet, uh, the veterinary hospice community. One of the views sees euthanasia as the ultimate treatment, the, the last gift we get to give our pets. And I know many of us have heard that, have said that. That's what we're taught in school as veterinarians and veterinary technicians. Um, that's the, actually the only part of hospice we are taught in school. Tell them, comfort them by saying it is the last gift you can give your pet. Um, there are currently, I believe, only four schools who are trying to mainstream hospice as a part of the main curriculum, not as an elective. And, um, and we hope that's going to change too. Some of these major organizations are hoping to make that change as well. The other end of the spectrum, spectrum is that death should occur naturally. I don't take sides. Uh, the point is, the main point is, there are options, and speaking to you as pet owners, you as the pet owner should have those and all the options in between um, available to you. 
You and your hospice team should create a plan based on your pet's condition, as well as your spiritual beliefs, not to mention the unmentionables, the practical considerations of financial and time constraints. Not many people are going to talk about that. Veterinary hospice care addresses the needs of people who wish to care for their terminally ill and dying animals in the comfort of their own homes under the guidance and assistance of veterinarians and a professional qualified team of caregivers. I'll show you who those people are. It gives families the opportunity to make their own choices about euthanasia. It allows them to spend quality time with their animals and it reinforces the human animal bond that is a vital part of our life story. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this picture, I'm sure most of you. This is John and Shep. And um, when I asked them if I could use this picture, they said as long as it's for educational purposes, I said absolutely. And um, John, uh, Shep is a 15 year old mixed breed who has severe arthritis. And John takes him into Lake Superior as often as he can and as you can see, he, he floats. He allows him to just float. And it's, there's a, a YouTube video of this um, that you hear John whispering, oh, here comes another swale. And he gets so excited because that allows Shep's body to just be moved in such a gentle fashion. And he does fall asleep in John's arms whenever he goes out there. It's, it, it truly is another one of these images. This is what hospice can be. Hospice places guardians at the forefront of the decision-making process and empowers them, you, to determine when and how their animals will die. The two most important aspects of hospice care are first, pain evaluation and management, relieving any discomfort in the pet. Reading pain can be difficult, hence the reason that you need a professional to help in that. I can't tell you the amount of times that I have had um, people that I've been working with, families I've been working with, and um, you know, the husband will say, well, you know, he didn't seem painful. I just took him out last week, you know, or four days ago, and we had a nice two-mile walk, and the husband will look at him and go, you have, that dog has not been out for a two-mile walk in a month. So the reality is, we, we, and I'll talk about this later too, is a quality of life scale. Um, but it's imperative to know that hospice is about pain relief, reading that pain, understanding what's going on, Second is palliative care, which improves the quality of life of patients and families through the prevention and relief of suffering by treating the symptoms. So palliation is the treatment of the symptoms. I want to share with you, I will tell you that I, I'm playing with this now because today I was aware of all the additional information I wanted to share with you all. Um, when we talk about pain and versus suffering, pain and suffering don't, are not the same. Um, Pain is a part of suffering, but suffering in, in a kind of broad definition is the diminishment of character, the diminishment of behaviors, the diminishment of he used to love to take a ride or a walk and he doesn't do that anymore. He used to always interact with other people, his housemates, he doesn't do that anymore. Um, there are, uh, when we talk about pain, there are places, there's a place called the Downing Center. I got to meet Dr. Downing, absolutely amazing. The International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management, Colorado State University is doing pain scales. So there is lots of information, lots of resources out there for, for your doctors, your nurses, for yourselves to look at and, and get a better understanding of what pain is all about. Palliation is medical comfort care, non-curative, medical comfort care, pain management, infection control, that's antibiotics, nutritional support, non-curative surgical procedures to make any condition less severe or intense through traditional medicine or complementary therapies, et cetera, and, and basically the improvement of quality of life. This is moving from cure to care. Hospice as defined by human hospice is limited life prognosis of six months or less. My business is titled Comfort Care because I truly do believe that this is something we need to start looking at and talking about before that time. 
uh, preferably when a pet reaches his senior age, and that will use an average of eight years old. But your veterinarian and you, depending on your, the dog's pet's breed and size, can tell you when they believe your pet has reached senior age, um, or when an animal is given a life-limiting diagnosis. Comfort care at this stage can be all that hospice is and will be with the intention of educating the family, supporting them in their anticipatory grief, and, the most, imp and most importantly, offering the best quality of life for the patient for as long as is possible. I met Gracie, um, a red uh, Doberman mix, uh, just before Christmas 2011. Um, Gracie, Gracie's mom called me through gray muzzle, said, do you know anybody who can pet sit for me over the Christmas holidays uh, for my 14-year-old hospice dog? And those were her words, not mine. Uh, she, in fact, was a hospice, is a hospice social worker. And um, I said, absolutely, I can do that for you. And I met with her two hours. I sat on the floor with Grace in that two-hour time period we talked. And I can tell you that within minutes, of being there, I was aware that Grace was really ill, and she was dying. Um, not actively dying in that moment, but she was definitely dying. Uh, she was unresponsive, lethargic, there was no life behind those eyes, and she was obese. Her owner, as we continued to talk, I became extremely aware that she was very anxious, really fatigued. Um, she was ready to to hand over her caregiver duties uh, to someone temporarily. And, um, sorry. She had not seen her family that lived up north in over a year. Um, she had actually, her whole life had been work and caring for Gracie, work and caring for Gracie for a year. Gracie was four to five months into her four to five month prognosis of congestive heart failure when I met her. Um, I knew that I could offer this owner the respite that she needed. In the week I spent with Gracie, I assessed her diet and changed it dramatically, added some supplements and relieved her of her chronic diarrhea. I also helped her during a time period to find a regular veterinarian. And I know that sounds crazy, the dog had been diagnosed. She had a cardiologist. What she didn't have was a regular veterinarian. She was vet hopping, as we call it. If the veterinarian didn't give her the antibiotics that she wanted, she would vet hop to the next veterinarian. And lots of people do that. Um, she was receiving a handful of pills at each meal. And if you've ever seen the pills for congestive heart failure, they're about this big. And she was receiving several of those a day. Um, the owner complained that it was difficult to always, you know, get her to take these pills. So I showed her a pilling trick that worked well to get them all in without a fuss. I also saved the owner money and time by preparing wholesome healing meals. Over the next year, and yes, it was a whole year, Gracie's owner trusted me enough to pet sit a few more times, giving her respite and a better relationship with her dog by being able to go away and come back happier better focused, a different perspective. Gracie was doing so well that she was able to get back to her daily evening walks with the neighborhood dogs. There was even some time at the dog beach in the dog park, and a picture with Santa that I took her, um, Golden, Golden Fest was doing pictures with Santa uh, this past Christmas, and uh, I took Grace in, it was between Thanksgiving and Christmas, I took her in and had her picture taken with Santa. She had never had that done. Her owner was thrilled to see those pictures. Um, sadly, on another pet sitting date, which was this past Christmas, Gracie got sick. I immediately recognized the symptoms of bloat. Um, I, I knew that she would have to be euthanized. So I raced her into the specialty hospital where I knew they'd have her records. I had her medical power of attorney with me. I had her living will with me. Um, all signed and dated appropriately. Um, so it had been, but it, it had been a whole year later. Gracie died in my arms Christmas Eve, evening, actually 2012. But it was a year later after our first meeting. 
Her owner's one request was that Gracie not die without her there. From the very first time I met her, she said, she cannot die if I'm not here. Now, she was in Massachusetts um, all this time, and, and other times took trips more locally. But of course, I, I couldn't guarantee that, um, that any time over the year, that she, she might die with her not being there. Um, that took some coaching. Um, I will tell you that when she died in my arms, her mommy was on the speaker of my cell phone, being able to tell her how much she loved her. Uh, once the body was prepared for viewing, I made certain that she, was, she had a, a lovely little viewing at, at the Pete's um, funeral home. Um, I made certain that she looked peaceful. I arrived prior to the owner of coming, and I made sure that she did look peaceful. Her lip was stuck up a little. We made sure their tongue was in and her lip was down. And I wanted to make sure she had her charm around her neck, a charm that I had given and left for her owner that is a pair of charms. The animal has one, the owner has the other. Um, I was glad I went because it wasn't there on her neck. So I went into the viewing with the owner when she arrived. I, not by my choice, I asked her, I said, are you nervous? She said, yeah, I am. And I said, she looks beautiful and peaceful. And I said, so would you like me to go with you? And she said, yeah. So we held hands and we wandered into the room and, and I told her honestly, I said, I, I know she was on a beautiful little table altar and um, she was covered in a blankie and I just said, I just want you to know her fur is very soft. I put my hand on her and I said, she's cold and she's a little firm. And I said, but you know, Gracie loved the cold and she laughed. The owner laughed and she said she did love the cold. And I said, and you know, look her ears, her little Doberman ears that had never stuck straight up. We're now straight up. <laughs> and, and I said, and, and I want you to look at her paws. I said, look at her paws. She no longer has those awful fungal infections on her paws. I said, they're gone. And I said, so we, we stood, we talked. I facilitated, you know, um, getting her through that, that first sighting. And, um, and I said, now I'm going to leave you for your private time. She did call me later and tell me that it was a beautiful time for her. And um, prior to leaving Gracie's home, before her owner arrived home, I left an altar there. She had multiple sofa tables. So I cleared a sofa table as best I could. Remember, I'm a designer, so I'm allowed to do this. And uh, I left, made an altar with her collar and her leash and a couple of toys. I put a candle there that I had purchased. And I left just enough room for her box of ashes so that she would not have to get home and say, where do I go with this? Um, I touch base with her still to this day to make sure all is well. And I do believe um, from things that have been said already that there will come a day that she will call me for help in adopting the next perfect dog. Gracie was a hospice success story. This is Gracie. There's Gracie. That actually is Gracie just hours before she passed. That is the Christmas toy she got for me that morning. Um, and she was peacefully sleeping there to the point of dreaming, and huffing and sighing. Um, and that bandage was on her paw because of her fungal infection. But she was in, she was in absolutely wonderful state of mind, good life, good quality of life, up until the moment the blow hit. Um, and I thank goodness, and I actually had um, several of the owner's friends, or at least one of the owner's friends, who had said to me, I'm so glad that you were with her when this happened, because no one else would have known what to do. And God forbid that Gracie had bloated, she didn't bloat, actually bloat, physically bloat, until I actually got her to the emergency room. Had she been at home and bloated, she was already an 80 pound dog, she would have been nearly impossible for a single person to get into a car, let alone to get her to an emergency center. Um, I talk about quality of life when I talk about Gracie, and um, there are things called the quality of life scales. Um, I suggest to everybody, you make one now. Make a quality of life scale now, whether your pet is two years old, five years old, 10 years old, or 15 years old. The reality is that you know when you have, and if they're happy and healthy, you say, great. He plays with his toys, he does this, he does that, she loves to go for rides, she interacts with people, whatever it may be. 
Um, she can still clean herself when we're talking about cats. She still purrs when I love on her. Um, when you have that back baseline at any point in life and you kind of go in and, and relook at it, recheck it every year, maybe before that annual physical, you already have that baseline in black and white. It's non-refutable quantitative information. This goes back to what I was talking about, the husband and the wife. You know, no, he was just out for a walk last week. We went two miles. No, it was a month ago. Or, you know, the, the, the son and daughter, you know, who's the, the brothers who say, no, we, you know, we were, he was really good. He was playing with us when we were out in the yard the other day. And, and, they, and you know, the tenant and the mother will say, no, it was raining that day. You weren't out in the yard that day. So this is unrefutable, black and white evidence that you have. You're not guessing. And this information, you use it in the future when your pet shows signs of aging or is diagnosed with a life-limiting disease. I have two slightly different quality of life skills here, and I know you can't read those. Um, but I just want to tell you a little bit about them. And I have copies out on the resource table for you. There is also a feline um, HHN scale. And um, the only difference is, is here in this um, Dr. Alice Noel Lobos, who created the Quality of Life Scale, um, so this is an older version, she uses the term, um, where is she here, more good days than bad and happiness, whereas over a peck, uh, this is by Lap of Love, which is a more contemporary um, life scale, they use the term interaction attitude and favorite things. So I suggest that if you, if you use the parameters set out by these professionals and kind of create your own quality of life scale, it definitely will help you make better end of life decisions for your pet. I also talk about um, the need for baseline blood panels. Um, again, that would be ideal if that could happen when your pet is still healthy and happy and perhaps they're a senior as they turn to their senior age. Get them in there. I know it's a little pricey, but the difference, it, the difference it can make is the difference between life and death. An eight-year-old dog goes in, he's happy, as healthy, his blood work all comes out normal, that's wonderful. Two years from now, you go to the doctor and you say, you know, he's just seeming a little lethargic, or he's thrown up a couple of days, or something else is going on. The doctor says, okay, we're gonna do another blood panel, and boom, looks like he's got something going on with his kidneys, or his liver, that we didn't have before. And that quick diagnosis makes the difference between life and death for an old dog. So those are my those are my two perky things: the quality of life scale and that and that baseline blood work. Um, here is a list of services um, to better understand all the facets of the work of hospice care and uh, comfort care. Uh, special needs pet sitting. I talked about that with Gracie's mom. Giving people respite care from their caregiving duties. Um, again, I'd like to say to everyone here, this also, respite care is care we need to, as the pet owner, be aware of. Um, as you know, you all are familiar with compassion fatigue, and that happens to these caregivers. They, they run out, their well runs dry, even with their own pets. And, and I don't know about you, but I've experienced it myself. There's a level of frustration um, that, that, that creeps in, and that's when you need that break. That's when you need that help. Um, assess and manage quality of life by enriching the pet's environment. I talked about Freckles Lily Pads. Um, that offered her the opportunity, and, and I know for a fact you can go to Home Depot and get, you know, runners for, you know, 25 cents a foot or something like that that you can roll out there. They're not pretty, but they work, and you just have to kind of waggle how it works from one room to the other, and it's very inexpensive. Um, and that's just, that's just one form of environmental enrichment. Obviously, we want to talk about, um, you know, keeping them mentally alert, and I have one of those wonderful games, and I, I unfortunately, my alley, she's smart enough that she figured out the, um, the game right away. Um, so now I take it away from her, and I only allow her to play with it like once every two months, hoping that maybe she'll forget. Um, but, but, but meant, you know, enriching the environment, enriching their mental and their physical stability, mobility, that's all really important. Creating an individual nutritional plan, that was, again, something that I talked about with Gracie. Um, we, we are all um, really good pet owners in this room. Um, the, the reality is, though, that even the level of nutrition has changed, the level, level of the quality of our diets 
and the uh, complexity of the diets has changed dramatically. Having someone who is a professional who can help steer you to say, in this particular case, because of kidney disease, you know, we all run to the veterinarian and they give us KD diet or they give us DD diet or LD diet or whatever these diets are. Um, and they're very expensive. And some people can't afford that. So, so there are alternatives. Um, acting as liaison to your veterinarian is something that we're not coming into this and saying we're, we're negating your veterinarian. They're at the, they're the top of the pyramid. We want them engaged and involved completely because our hope would be that if we choose euthanasia, or when we choose euthanasia, that and you'd like it to be in-home euthanasia, that we've got our veterinarian on board for that. Cool. There are many tools out there um, to help educate about tradition, tra condition, training and administration of medications and therapies. I mentioned about helping um, Gracie's mom you know, pill her much more easily as opposed to shoving things in the poor dog's throat. Um, and um, simple things for me, like, simple for me, um, fluid administration. Uh, when you're doing fluid therapy, um, the, the simplest act of where do we do it? Where is the most comfortable place for everyone? The pet, as well as the caregiver, where is the most comfortable place in the house to do that? And, and I have an eye to be able to walk in and say, you know, if you're comfortable with this, right there on the kitchen bar, off to the side, we can hang the fluid up here on the handle of the cabinet, or it might be best if we do it over here. There's, there, those are just, again, some examples. Um, this is the part I wanted to get to with you all. Coordinate a team of caregivers with advanced directives, living will, and pre-planning. Pre-planning is something that you can talk to Brian Laurent at Pets at Peace um, at any point in time, preferably as the pet is older or when it does, when it is diagnosed with that terminal illness. You can get all the business stuff out of the way. All that information about do you want a cremation? Do you want a burial? Do you want an individual cremation? Do you want communal cremation? You know, here's how much it's going to cost. All of that can be signed off and done ahead of time um, so that you're not left making those kinds of awful business decisions when your mind is not in that place and your heart is not in that place. Um, this particular uh, directives in living will, I mentioned to you that, you know, as, as a, a pet sitter and someone who has, I have liability insurance, I also have always up-to-date signed medical directives, uh, living wills, and power of attorney with me so that I, I am able to, at any point in time, throw that at whoever may need that information. Uh, so I don't want any kind of pain or suffering happening that I don't have some control over. Um, this particular list of people is from a group called, um, it's out of Bright Haven Sanctu Hospice Sanctuary in California. They do amazing work. They have actually been able to, as a sanctuary with volunteers and all of these wonderful practitioners, they've been able to flip-flop the 90% euthanasia, 10% natural dying the other direction. Um, so they have 10% euthanasia for those cases like seizure dogs or pain breakthrough diseases. And 90% of their animals die naturally. Um, helped and transitioned to that point and through that point by this team of caregivers. You see the list of the different veterinarians. They rely heavily on their homeopath um, in transitional time. Um, I do have a homeopath that I work with. Her brochure is on the table. Uh, the veterinary nurse, that's me. Um, acupuncture, as I mentioned, I'm a firm believer in acupuncture for humans and animals. Um, I even talk to my acupuncturist who it does do in-home calls. Um, and I, she's so gentle. I've never seen anyone who is just so compassionate and knowledgeable and so gentle. Um, I said to her, um, I said, do you do human acupuncture? She said, I do actually have sometimes people who will ask if I will do acupuncture on them while I'm here because my neck is really bothering me from lifting him or her or whatever. And she said, I can't really do that, but, but I will do it for friends and clients. Um, with any of my practitioners, that's the first thing I asked them was, are you comfortable with doing your healing work on the humans as well as on the animal? And the Reiki healer, um, the homeopath all said yes. You know, and I loved that about them. I immediately took them into my community because I knew that they would be there, not only for that pet, but that they could help um, 
that family as well in this in this very difficult time. Um, Ayurveda is, is one of the oldest forms of medicine. It's Indian medicine. Um, flower essences, I do practice with the flower essences myself. Um, I uh, am studying more about herbal medicine, uh, veterinary chiropractic. We don't have this collective group of people here in Florida, let alone here in Naples. Um, I would hope that we could watch this build as veterinary hospice becomes something that's really out there. But you see the additional support team members. Your pet sitter and your groomer can be really important people in early diagnosis. They're the ones who are gonna feel those lumps and bumps and the icky skin and you know checking between the paws and in the ears. Um, family, friends, neighbors, church or religious groups, spiritual and grief counselors about hospice, about cares as it's now called. I noticed that you do have their brochures out on the counter. They have group as well as individual um, pet bereavement uh, counseling and pet loss services. We do a rainbow day uh, twice a year, which is really wonderful. And um, we have the blessing of the animals at the Feast of St. Francis as well. Um, assisting in the creation of a ceremony, honoring the companion. People may choose to memorialize at that moment, uh, may have just an altar. I light a candle to this day for Junior, Junior, and uh, he died in September of last year. But every day I light that candle and every night I blow it out to say goodnight. Um, he, um, I think that there's possibilities that people are out of options, again, that people are unaware of when we talk about ceremony. Um, I don't care if you want to have a salsa party or you want to have a quiet, you know, you and your pet ceremony time. You, maybe a lit candle, maybe not. Um, Brighthaven does these. Brighthaven will keep their animals in state for three days. And, and just so that you know that, that there is that possibility. No one is saying to you, okay, you've seen it, you've done it, the body has to go away. It doesn't have to be that way. There are options um, once once you make the decision as to you know what you and your pet would like to have happen after death. Um, providing referrals to qualified professionals and community support services again uh, have lots of that out there on the table on the resource table and resources recommending resources. I've got millions of of uh, resource materials uh, that I am willing to share. Um, I wanted to go back to um, the liaison with your veterinarian and talking about you know people who don't have a regular veterinarian that they work with, and I'm not the only one who feels this way. And uh, Sunday, April 7th paper, um, there was a story about um, Ohio State University and their cancer uh, canine cancer studies. And I'm going to quote a doctor, Dr. Thompson, who says, one of the best ways as a veterinarian to be able to know what is not normal is to have a long-standing relationship with a pet so that abnormal is more easily determined. Um, and I will tell you that in terms of the other shocking thing for me in this article was that um, another veterinarian who is one of the associate professors who's doing these trial studies says that in dogs, about 50% of dogs that live until 10 years of age will develop some form of cancer. 50% of all dogs that reach 10 years of age will develop some form of cancer. So if we don't need hospice, now when do we? I am inspired constantly by my dogs, by, my, by the people around me, by people like Amanda and Dr. Noel and, and everyone in this room and my friends, um, like I said, all of my dogs, I, I find inspiration for design as well as the hospice care in everything. Uh, this was a saying I actually picked up on a beautiful plaque at Home Goods. You know, I said, I think there's a lot of Buddha, these Buddhist monks who work for Bed Bath and Beyond Target, and, um, <laughs> Kmart, whoever has all these wonderful sayings. I was in Office Depot actually recently. They've got fabulous plaques with with work saying, business sayings on them that are very inspirational. Um, so I found this and I love this. Nobody can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone, everyone can start today and make a new ending. That's what hospice is all about. Whatever you decide for your pet, do not leave it until the last minute. 
People who have not thought this through before the animal is suffering might find themselves in an ER hospital having to make instant and expensive decisions about complex, unnecessary medical procedures. Not to mention a less than kindly end of life in a sterile environment surrounded by strangers. That is the nightmare that many of us have experienced, the horror stories that I'm told, and the nightmare that I'd like to see less people have to endure. Um, if you do the necessary planning, then you're able to tell yourself that you did everything you could. Based on the information that you had, you were responsible, you acted from love, and you did the very best you could do in that moment. We're only human. In that moment, you did the best you could do. And for all those people who say, they're too busy to get another dog, I'd like to propose that many older dogs, many older pets, would like to be, would be only too happy to get out of their crates and kennels and off the cold floor of the shelter to spend their days <laughs> basking in the sunlight on the living room rugs of busy people who are at work. Um, they're, quite a, they're quite a crew. They all look a little chubby and very, very content. Um, let your pets inspire you to be their advocate through all their life and you'll be repaid tenfold with happy memories and an open heart. Thank you for listening.